15. We're looking at part 34 of the 10 times the Jews rebelled against God in the wilderness wanderings. Now last week we finished rebellion test number four at Rephidim, which taught us lessons about prayer and spiritual warfare. And at the end of Ephesians 6, we learned that spiritual wickedness in high places, which the Apostle Paul talks about that over in Ephesians chapter 6, is very key to the spiritual warfare. The word that is translated wickedness means depraved, degenerate, vicious, malicious, lewd. And it's a reference to all the hosts under the leadership of the echelons of power of Satan and his demonic host that Paul has just discussed in the preceding verses. The focus is on the moral decadence and the permeating evil of the character of the demonic host. Now we're in the spiritual war. Rephidim was where Israel was warring against Amalek and we learn some very important principles from that and we transfer those over to the warfare that we are involved in and we see the character of the one whom we are fighting. The evil character of the leader of the hosts of hell is called the evil one just as the holy angels reflect the righteous moral character of their leader, the Holy One of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. God says that Satan and his followers, both angelic and human, are decadent, defiled, perversely evil, and are not ignorant of what is good. They have deliberately chosen to rebel against God's moral standards and his divinely revealed order of holiness. So in this war, you only have two options. You don't have multiple options. There are no conscientious objectors. You're either on one side or on the other side. Either you're engaged in the fight or you're being deceived and lulled into sleep by the devil until he can destroy you. The whole world is controlled by Satan. That says so over in 1 John 5, 18 and 19. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one, same thing we saw over in Ephesians 6, that's Satan, toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. All the rest of the world, outside of the body of Christ, is under the control of Satan, even if they're nice people. They're controlled by the devil. Last week I pointed out that immediately following the warning about the wicked one and the whole world lying in wickedness, that the very last verse in 1 John warns against idolatry because that is the very next test that Israel faced in the wilderness, idolatry, the golden calf. Very last verse, 1 John 5, 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. We saw that the thing that should trouble us most about that is Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 5 that a believer can have internal wickedness that is worthy of death. You know, sometimes we tread right on the edge of that and don't realize that God could, if he chose to do so, kill us for those particular types of sins. Over in Ephesians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see that there are six specific sins mentioned. Fornication, that's sexual immorality, and it includes adultery, and it includes homosexuality, and it includes transvestitism, and it includes bestiality, and all kinds of other horrible perversions. Covetousness, Paul says in Ephesians 3, 5, and Coloss uh, excuse me, Colossians 3, 5, and Ephesians 5, 5, that covetousness is idolatry, and the covetous man is an idolater. You say, well, it's just, just a little bit of covetousness is okay, because I just love to window shop and imagine myself dressed in that dress or wearing those things or the man is you know he's looking around at fishing rods and he's looking around at the rifles and he's looking around at the other man i sure would like to have that that 410 shotgun and go blow away from ducks boom, boom, boom. covetousness is idolatry be careful the covetous man is an idolater it's one of the six sins that's listed here railing where it's screaming and yelling and about other people and how bad they are, that's in the same category. You know, bad-mouthing other people. It's in the same category of sick drunkenness. Hey, say, well, I can hold my liquor. No, you can't. You get a little bit in you, and it controls you a little bit. You get more in you, it controls you more. Well, I can smoke if I want. No, it's defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and him that defiles the temple of the Spirit, God will destroy Bottom line, period, over and out. We are to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Well, can't I let the flesh control a little bit? No. You are to be filled with the Spirit. You put in a little alcohol, and that's where you're not filled with the Spirit. Dear friends, this is serious stuff. Extortion. 
That means ripping people off. And all of us do that at some time or other, don't we? You know, the, the clerk gives you back and you look at it, oh, you got 25 cents extra, the clerk made a mistake. You stick it in your pocket. I have gone back into stores when I went outside and I look at my receipt and I look at my change when they have given me one penny too much and I walk back in and I give them the penny because it's not mine. You say, you're a fanatic. No. Someday I will give account to God for every nickel, dime, penny, dollar, whatever else God put into my hands. And he allows us to go through these tests because a man who's faithful in that which is small is going to be faithful in that which is big. A little bit, a lot. God says, are you faithful? Will you handle the things that I give you in this world in such a way that it brings me glory? Or are you going to yield to the stupid temptation? to keep that extra quarter or that extra dollar. Like the lawyer who uh, was paid in cash by his client and uh, uh, the client owed him $100 and um, the client handed him the $100 and walked out and then the lawyer realized as he pushed the money that there were $200 bills and so he, he was faced with a dilemma. The dilemma was should he split that second hundred with his partner? <laughs> no folks, that's not the way it is. It goes back. Every day we are faced with little tests like that, aren't we? The Bible tells us multiple times, and whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Does this glorify God? Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ and he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. People, let's start learning to live like Christians instead of pointing the finger at other people and saying how bad they are while we tolerate ourselves and excuse ourselves and hide under the blanket so nobody can see us while we're doing our stuff. Fornication, covetousness, Oh, by the way, fornication would include pornography. You look at pornography, you read dirty books. You know what pornography means? It's from the Greek words, it means fornicator writings. It fits under a fornication. You're treading the edge of the fire. You need to get rid of it. Never touch it again. Never look at it again. 1 Corinthians 5. It's reported commonly that there's fornication among you, the church at Corinth, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And the church at Corinth thought, oh, that's okay. They weren't going to do anything about it. Guy sleeping either with his mother or if his mother was dead and his father remarried, the woman that his father married, and maybe his father died too, and so he's taking her for his own. You know what? God says that's filthy immorality. In fact, he says, the church there, hey, they're pretty proud of that. You're puffed up and enough rather mourn that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already. Yes, you can judge that kind of sin as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. Now, verses 4 and 5. When that kind of thing goes on in a church, this is what's to happen. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, that's the church assembled, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's under his exousia, under his authority, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The church corporate says, God, that man is polluting the church. That woman is polluting the church. They're openly violating your word in the church. God, please use Satan to kill him. I prayed that prayer last week. He says, let us keep the feast. Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover sacrifice for us, takes you back to the Old Testament feast of Passover. 
Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. Now look, you're surrounded by people like that. He doesn't say, you're supposed to isolate yourself on a desert island where there's nobody else except you. He says, the world around you lives like that. That's what characterizes the world. But if a Christian does this, I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. You don't even have a hot dog with them. For what have I to do to judge them that are also without? Do not ye judge them that are within. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked, and there's our word, that wicked person. In other words, throw them out. Church prays for them, and prays that God will use the devil to kill them. And we gave you one of the Old Testament illustrations on that. Uh, it's one of the ones that the New Testament uh, mentions among the ten failures of Israel. Other examples are given in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, These things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust, lust after evil things, neither be ye idolaters, neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day 23,000. And we paused on that last week because there have been some sex sins in this church. And uh, so we prayed that God would kill that person. There were people right outside the tabernacle praying while some of the men of Israel were fornicating with the Moabitish women. And one of those bad guys actually, you know, pushed his way through the crowd of worshipers who were begging God to clean it. And he drags this Moabitish woman and there's a tent sitting right outside the tabernacle and he pulls her inside and starts fornicating. And Phineas saw it and was incensed and took a javelin and they're lying on top of each other and he stabs them through with a javelin, pinned them to the ground, killed them. And God said, you're going to get blessed for that. Oh, man. People, I think the church today doesn't understand why God gave us these illustrations in the Old Testament. It's to teach us so that we will not commit the same sins they committed and so that we won't die in the wilderness like they died in the wilderness. He gave them ten shots at it. They failed every time and God killed them. And the only two from that first generation that made it into the promised land were Joshua and Caleb. All the rest of them, age 20 and younger, or age 20 and older, died, and the only the ones under 20 years old made it into the promised land. The rest of them died in the wilderness. Dangerous stuff here. Well, anyway, so Paul goes on with the examples of wickedness that God found in his own people. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither tempt ye, uh, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Don't point the finger at somebody else. You, I've got some people here that drive me nuts. They never admit their own sin. They're always pointing the finger at somebody else. Stop doing it. Examine yourself. Because God is examining you, and you can cover it all you want. But you may be on sin number nine right now, and God's about to kill you. To make sure we didn't miss the point, that destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is an example for us today. We find it both in Second Peter and over in Jude, and our country is going that way. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them unto chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, the preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood of, on the world of the ungodly. So, first illustration was the angels. He cast them to hell. Second illustration is Noah, and God saved him out of the flood and killed everybody else. And it was killing people God's job because he's righteous and he has the right to kill sinners. Third illustration, which applies to us in the United States of America. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. He burned up Sodom and Gomorrah. Adma, Zeboim. Only there were five cities of the plain. Zoar is the only one he didn't destroy, and that's the one where he let Lot and his daughters go. And they later ended up committing horrible fornication up in the mountains. That's where the, the country of Moab and Ammon came from. 
Lot and his two daughters. And they gave Israel grief all the way through the history of Israel. To make sure we don't miss the point, Jude 1.7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, get the last phrase, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That brought us to rebellion test number five at Horeb, the golden calf, Exodus 32. Uh, we all tend to think of that as the big one. But all ten points of rebellion nailed the coffin of Israel and closed, ended in their wilderness deaths. Exodus 32, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Ha! Oh, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, as though that's nothing, we want not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Ooh, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll be the new leader. You know, Brother Moses has been a pretty big cheese around here, but if he's gone and the people don't care, I'll be the big leader. What can I do to get the people to follow me? Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them with their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf. And they, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. How stupid can you get? They didn't even exist until they got to that point. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow's a feast unto the Lord. He used the right name, but boy, was he off base in the way he worshipped him. There are a lot of people who pretend like they're worshipping the true God of heaven, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They use the right name, but they're all on their way to hell. And they rose up early in the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's what Paul quoted over in 1 Corinthians 10. We read it just a moment ago. And the Lord said unto Moses, Moses is up on the mountain. All this stuff's going on down there in the plain. Go, get thee down for thy people, which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt to corrupt themselves. God says, they're your people. Hey, what's going on with your people? And Moses turns that back around and says, no, Lord, they're your people. <laughs> They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it. They have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, o, o, o Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, and my wrath wax hot against them, that I may consume them. And Moses, hey, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Moses is having some tests, too. Not exactly the same tests that the children of Israel are facing, but there's that test of power. There's that test of Moses getting tired of the children of Israel. You know, think of what he had to put up with in the wilderness wanderings. They're always trying to kill him. They're always griping and moaning and groaning and complaining. They never obey what he says to do, even though it's a direct word from God. Moses could say, wow. You mean, God, you promise you will, you'll kill them? <laughs> I don't care about whether you make me some. Just kill them. Just get rid of them. Well, God was going to do that. It took 40 years to do it. But he's testing Moses. Moses, would you like to be the big cheese? I will have your descendants be my promised nation. Hey, you're Jewish. It goes back to Abraham. I can still fulfill my covenant promises, and I can do it through you. Moses didn't bite. Moses besought the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? See, God said, these are your people. Moses says, they're thy people, which thou hast brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak? In other words, why should you give the Egyptians opportunity to criticize you, God? Because you're the God of heaven. Don't let them badmouth you. Why should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath. Repent thee of this evil against thy people. You know, you can always remind God of his promises. When you pray, don't pray based on what you want. Pray based on the promises of God. That's what Moses is doing here. Don't pray in such a manner that you're exuding the flesh things that you're mad about defend instead the character of God God it's your name that's at stake 
God. These are ones who call themselves your people. Oh Lord, please keep your promises to your people. That's what Moses does. He says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. You see, Moses was just from one tribe. He was from the tribe of Levi, and he reminds God that God gave the promise not only to Abraham, that's one guy, so of course he's descended from him, and Isaac, that's one guy, uh, and Jacob and Esau descended from him, but God has already set aside Esau, so it's going to be Jacob, it's Israel, he's called it in the passage here, but you gave a promise to them concerning the 12 tribes. God, if you're going to keep that promise, you've got to keep somebody alive from all 12 tribes. I just represent one tribe. I'm descended from Levi. Do you understand? His, he's pointing God back to God's promises. When you can take the promises of God and pray the promises of God, he always keeps his word and he always defends his name. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now the first thing that we learned about this test last week deals with the issue of patience. When the people saw Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, this Moses, yeah, that guy, what's his name? Oh, 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 what's his face? Moses, Moses, yeah, yeah, Moshe, okay? The man that brought us up out of Egypt. You know, that guy, you remember what he did? Yeah, back there someplace a couple of months ago, he, he brought us up out of Egypt. We want not what has become of him. Who cares what happened to Moses? Can you imagine if somebody has just delivered you, you've seen the ten plagues, you've seen him stretch his arm out over the, the Red Sea, you've seen the walls of water stand up on both sides, you've walked through on dry ground, you've seen the walls of water close in on Pharaoh's chariots, and you say, you know, old, what's his face? You know, that, that guy, uh, yeah, well, we don't care what happened to him. Is that ingratitude or is that ingratitude? The Bible has a lot to say about patience because that's one of the prime tests that Israel failed. They were impatient. They wouldn't wait for Moses to come back. And some folks in this church are very impatient. I know you. I've lived here 11 years. Remember one of the wilderness tests was on the issue of patience. God killed people because they were impatient and rushed ahead with their own carnal plans while pretending to be spiritual. I looked at five passages on patience last week, and I've got a whole bunch more to show you today. Number one, patience is necessary for obedience and fruit bearing. Luke 8, 15. But that on the good ground, the seed, are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it. That's obedience. And bring forth fruit with patience. You don't have patience, you will never bear fruit. You know what the fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Ninefold fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. You will never bear the fruit of the Spirit if you do not have patience. You'll always be ugly. You'll always be mean. You'll always be criticizing somebody else. You'll always be screaming at somebody else. You'll always be upset with somebody else. You'll always be thinking you're right, which means you're full of pride. And pride was the sin of the devil, and God cast the devil to hell. You'll never bear genuine love, genuine joy, genuine peace, or long-suffering, or gentleness, or goodness, or faith, or meekness, or temperance, which means self-control. You'll always be flying off the handle and blowing your gasket. The only way to bring forth fruit is with patience. 
Second one we saw was patience is necessary for spiritual stability. If you don't have patience, you do not have spiritual stability. You are unstable. You're like a wave of the sea, driven with wind and tossed. Luke 21, 19. If you're in your patience, possess ye your souls. In other words, get control of your soul. Your body, soul, and spirit, your soul deals with your emotions. If you don't have patience, you will not control your emotions. Number three, patience is developed by responding properly to hard times. Romans 5, 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also. And those from tribulation come to say, yes, Lord, thank you for bringing that into my life. When was the last time you thanked God for bringing some horrible problem into your life? You know, by the grace of God, and only by the grace of God, I'm thankful that when God brought the most difficult thing I've ever experienced into my life, which was the death of Judy. My first response was, thank you, Lord, for giving her me for 42 years. I was crushed. I was bleeding all over the floor. I couldn't breathe. But I looked to heaven and I said, thank you, Father. You know I loved her. Not as I should, but I loved her. Thank you for giving her to me. How do you face tribulation? Romans 5, 4, and if you have the patience, you'll get experience. And then when you get experience, you begin to realize God's promises are true. And it gives you hope. Patience, experience, and experience, hope. You know, patience is developed when we walk by faith. Faith and patience are always seen together. Romans 8, 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's parallel with this verse in Romans, and that's Hebrews 11. The Bible is consistent in everything that it says. Patience is developed by studying the promises of the Bible. Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. You say, oh good, yeah, we can pack our head full of knowledge. Bong, bong. Okay, I got it. Let's see if I can balance that up there. And I, oh, well, I got it, I got it, I got it in my head. Folks, that's not where it works. It's when it gets out into your life, which is the second half of the verse. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Do you see how often patience is tied to hope and faith and to the promises of the word of God? I hope you're getting the point. Patience is central to the Christian life because we live in a world which is 100% opposed to us and under the control of the enemy, Satan. New ones for today. Patience and encouragement produce Christian unity instead of division. When we get all impatient with each other, you know what it does? It splits the church. And a lot of churches have been split because somebody got impatient with somebody else. They didn't like the way they were doing this. They didn't like the way they were doing that. And this one didn't like the way they were doing that. And this one didn't like the way they were doing that. And this one didn't like what that one thought. And this one over here thought they were crying because they didn't believe this yet. They were impatient. Listen to this, Romans 15, 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Have you learned that Sometimes it takes a while for people to get their minds and their hearts in sync. So if they're moving the same direction, direction, thinking the same things, doing the same things, encouraging one another, encouraging other believers, instead of 
everybody in the church out there doing their own thing. A lot of churches are like that, like a whole bunch of cowboys out there on the range and they're all busy roping cows, but they're not trying to do it together. They're just running their horses into the herd and see if they can get something. This one's coming across this way. This one's coming across this way. And they get the ropes tangled. A whole bunch of cows fall. And the, the horse falls down. The cowboys are getting trampled. They're yelling and screaming and shooting their pistols in the air. Listen, that is not the way God designed the church. Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded, one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. Patience in suffering is one of the proofs of a divine call to a Christian ministry. Paul applies it to himself. Listen. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience. And then he tells you how you get it. In afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. Did Paul have to put up with more than you have to put up? Well, I tell you, he sure had to put up with a lot more than I had to put up with. He talks about all the horrendous things that happened to him. You know, a night and a day in the deep, you know, being shipwrecked and the false brethren and, you know, the Jews and receiving uh, 39 lashes and, you know, being stoned and all this. He says, beside those things which are without notice, that's e easy stuff. People, that's the easy stuff. He says, besides that which is without, the things that come upon me daily. You say, oh, Paul, what, what is it that comes upon you daily? He says, the care of all the churches. That was harder for Paul to stomach than getting beaten with rods, stoned, shipwrecked where he's floating around with the sharks circling. All those exterior things were easier than what he had to put up with in the churches. God didn't choose the best people in the world, you know, to save. He chose the off-scourings, the scum of the world. That's us, folks. That's me. In all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience. Here are two things. Patience is, is in it for the long haul. Patience isn't Oh, okay, I'll be patient for the next three seconds. Well, I, I'll really hang in there. I'll be patient for the next five minutes. That is not patience. Patience is in it for the long haul. And patience, which relates to consideration of others, is the opposite of pride, which is based on self. Listen to Ecclesiastes 7, 8. Better is the end of a thing from, uh, than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. You see, pride always destroys patience. Pride gets irritable when other people don't do it our way. Pride gets mad and slams the door. Pride walks off in a huff because the other person wasn't quite up to snuff. If you don't have patience, you know what you got? Pride. Pride is the sin of the devil. Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28. Next one. Patience has the eternal perspective, not the temporal perspective. It has an eye to the future, not to the time present. Listen. Romans 2 7. To them who by patient continuance in well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. They're looking up there. It doesn't matter what you're going through down here. They're looking up there, and they're headed for that, and they're going to reach that goal by the grace of God. Does that characterize your life? Are you getting the idea that God has a lot to say about patience? You know why? He gives us all these passages to illuminate what Israel illustrated by their impatience with Moses when he went up onto the mountain and they said, what happened to him? We don't know what happened to him. Who cares about Moses? Let's get on with it. Let's move on. Now we'll come up with something. We've got to have a God. You know, every, every nation has a God, so let's make up one. Come on, Aaron. You're, you're the leader now, so what are you going to give us? I would say, oh, how, how about a, a, a gold-colored cow? Duh. Impatience leads you to sin. And God killed them for it. Patience has the eternal perspective, not the temporal perspective. Here's another one. Patience is part of the trilogy as to how a Christian can survive in the world. Romans 12, 12. 
Here's a trilogy of things that enable us to survive in the world. Patience is one of them. Rejoicing in hope. We've already seen the connection to hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Paul says that's the way the Christian survives. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. You focus on those three things. That's a trilogy that will help you as a Christian survive in this world. It's also listed as one of the four keys to dealing with Christians who are having trouble and who may, from your perspective, be a pain in the neck. One of the four keys to dealing with these problem Christians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 14. Now we exhort you, brethren. So here's what you as believers are supposed to be doing. Four things when you got people who are pain in the neck. Number one, here's the first group. You warn them that are unruly. Unruly is lazy. Number two, you comfort the feeble-minded. You know, every pastor has people who he just groans when they come up because they have some mindless thing to say. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. But I mean, I want to get on with it, Lord. You mean, I, I got to help this guy drag him along? Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. One of the four things as to how believers are to deal with other Christians who are either having trouble or who are a pain in the neck. Be patient toward all men. It's one of two keys to being in a right attitude toward God. One of two keys to being in a right attitude toward God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 5. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. That's number one. What's the first great commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. That's the number one. Number two here. Your right attitude toward God includes something else. And into the patient waiting for Christ. Every day. You don't stomp your foot and pout and throw a temper tantrum and say, God, why didn't Jesus come back yet? Come on, God, where's your promise? You promised, and he's not here yet. The patient waiting for Christ. Meanwhile, you're living 100% for the Lord Jesus Christ. Patience is the key visible manifestation of self-control in many areas. It's what you can see. And you know, it includes a lot of very practical things here. Not given to wine. Oh. Now, that doesn't mean you're a drunk in the gutter all the time. It's that you're clutching to yourself. Not given to is the word for clutching it as your right. I have the right to drink. We see this, by the way, in several different places. I'm going to drink if I want to. I don't care what anybody says. I think Jesus drank wine. And if Jesus can do it, I can do it. Well, Jesus also walked on water. Give it a try. No striker. No, there's somebody with a hot temper. Not greedy or filthy lucre. That's covetousness, isn't it? Hmm. Making money the wrong way. Instead, what does he give as the contrast? But patient. Not a brawler. That goes back to the no striker. Not covetous. That goes back to the not greedy of filthy lucre. And right in the middle of that, what controls these things that are swinging you like a pendulum each direction? You've got these weights on your arm. In the middle of that is patience. Did you perhaps guess that God might want you to develop this character quality for dealing with life? It's also one of the most important requirements for church leaders. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, that means skilled at teaching, 
patient. Patience keeps you from fighting with other people. But patient. Patience is an essential character quality to develop in your life if the Lord tarries his coming. James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband and waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it. He doesn't stand out in his garden, stamp his feet and say, come on, come on, grow, 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 grow. You're growing too slow, you corn plant there. He doesn't do that. He says, you've got to be the same way. Be patient under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband and waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it. Remember, you can't bear fruit unless you've got patience. Here James is saying the same thing by way of illustration until he received the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Verse 8. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Put up with all the garbage here on earth because Jesus is coming. I know it's going to be rough going through. And tribulation works patience. And patience endurance. And endurance hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts patient examine yourself right at this moment instead of thinking about I know some of you are thinking about somebody else think about yourself say am I patient am I patient now some of you are going come on get on with it preacher get on you know that you're not patient you want me to keep moving forward look at your watches is an essential character quality to develop. The only way to keep God focused so that you don't get frustrated by the wicked. Patience is the only way to keep God focused so you don't get frustrated by the wicked. Listen to what David says. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Quit worrying about the wicked. The only way to quit worrying about the wicked is to focus on God. Patiently wait for him. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear unto me, and he heard my cry. <clears throat> I hope that you're getting the idea that patience is absolutely essential in the Christian life, and the Bible has a lot to say about it. Impatience leads to bolting outside the will of God and landing in carnal sin like Israel did at the golden calf. Patience means that you're not only refra refraining from natural impulses, but that you examine each op option to see if it fits with biblical principles. It was impatience that moved the Jews to make and worship the golden calf, and that is one of the ten principal reasons that God killed Israel in the wilderness. Now our time is up, but I want to start there next week because patience is not sloth. A lot of people say, well, you know, he's just hanging out and uh, he's not really patient, he's just, he's just a lazy bum. No, the Bible talks about that and we'll talk about that next week. Dear Heavenly Father, the Lord willing, we pray that you might take your word and use it to our lives. Help us to quit pointing the finger at somebody else and always assuming that we're okay. You've listed whole categories of sin, six different areas of sin that cover a lot of territory. And if we're honest, instead of criticizing somebody else because we think that they are involved in one of those sins, help us to examine our own selves to see whether or not we be reprobate or whether or not we be in the faith. Father, once again, we thank you for your word and its power. It's rough. It slaps us around. It also gives us all the things that happened to Israel in the Old Testament as examples so that we won't have to die in the wilderness. Help us to take it to heart. Help us to take it personally. And then in the power of the Spirit to live to the glory of Jesus Christ instead of insisting on our own rights to live for Jesus. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today, if I can find my bulletin, is hymn number 620, Under His Wings I Am Safely Abiding. Number 620, we'll stand to sing.